Okay, so let's go ahead and install and configure Redis within our project. So first let's install it. So we'll run npm i at adonis.js slash redis. This will install it within our project. Okay, cool, it's installed. So we can clear this out. Now, this package also requires us to configure it within our project. The configuration process is essentially going to inform our project about the particular package and it will allow the package itself to run the necessary hooks that it needs to instantiate various things that it needs in order for us to successfully use the package itself. So to configure a package, we'll want to use the ACLI, so that'll be node ace, and there's a configure command. And to this configure command, we just need to provide the package name. So that's adonis.js slash redis. Once we have that run, we'll see that it's done four things for us. First, it's created a configuration within our config directory called redis.ts. Within this configuration is where we'll set up our connection to Redis itself. Then it's also updated our EMV file. Since that connection information is environment specific, this is where we're storing the connection information that our config is reading from. Then it's updated our start env.ts file requiring those new EMV variables that have been added into our .env file. And then lastly, it's updated our adonisrc.ts file, which we've yet to talk about. So now the adonisrc.ts file is essentially in charge of configuration for our project. It is where the package has added its provider into our provider's array. Providers essentially allow for the package to hook into our application's lifecycle to instantiate instances that it needs to in order for us to properly work with the package. It's also within that package's provider that it's going to read from our configuration to actually grab our connection details. Before we leave here, we can go ahead and boot our server back up. So npm run dev, and let's dive back into our project. So we left off within our .env file, and within this file, we see three new variables. We have our Redis host, our Redis port, and a Redis password. Now by default, this package has set us up with a Redis host and Redis port value. These two values are actually the default values for Redis itself. So if you haven't changed anything within your Redis configuration, you're most likely okay to leave these values as is. The same goes for the password. By default, it's not gonna utilize a password. So unless you've explicitly set up a password for your Redis configuration, you won't need to provide one in here either. Since we're on our local machine, we're not really worried about passwords at this point in time. Now within the env.ts file, that's where we're specifying that our host and our port are required. So if we dive into here, we'll see two new additions for our Redis host and our Redis port. The Redis host is specifying that it should be a string and that string should be a host format. A host format is basically going to look like an IP address. It's going to be that 127.0.0.1 value that we have within our .env file. And then the port should be a number. Remember that the port kind of serves as like the street address for the server that we want to reach to on the specific host. So we're A-OK -okay here. I'll go ahead and give that file a save so that it fixes our missing comma. All right, the next thing that the configuration step changed was our adonisrc.ts file. So let's go ahead and dive into there. And we'll see that we're calling define config and providing that some form of an object. This object contains commands, service providers. There's that providers array that we had mentioned. And specifically, here's our Redis provider right here. So it's within this Redis provider that the Redis package is reading from our configuration setting up the connection, and then providing us back a Redis package to actually be able to work with. There's some other things going on within this adonisrc.ts file, but we don't need to care about them at this point in time. We'll come across them as they become important to the series topic. So we'll go ahead and close this out for now. And the last thing that was added to our project was a new configuration file specifically for Redis with connection details. By default, our Redis config is going to have a default connection called main, and then we'll have a connections object that will allow us to define multiple connections if we need to. Out of the box though, we'll just have that single main default connection. And this main default connection is going to use the host and the port, and if needed, the password that we have set within our environment variables. It's also got some additional configuration going on down here as well. You might notice that we're reading from env.get to actually read from our environment variables. If we scroll up to see where that's coming from, we'll see it's being imported from our start directory and specifically that env.ts file. So one nice thing about that file is not only is it providing type safety whenever we boot our server up, but it's also providing type safety whenever we actually try to read from it as well. So if we scroll back down to where we call those gets and we remove, let's say our Redis host altogether, let's remove the strings as well, and we type strings back in, we're gonna get an autocomplete of the variables that we have defined within our env.ts so that we know what we have within our environment variables and we could say, okay, I want the Redis host, click on it, and there we go. Now, for me particularly, I need to change one more thing in here. You most likely don't need to worry about this whatsoever. Redis allows you to have multiple different databases specified by this DB0, which is the default database. I'm already using DB0 for the Atticast project, so I need to switch to a different index. For this one, 
I'll switch it to one. Again, you most likely don't need to change this whatsoever. So I'm going to give that a save, collapse our config back down, scroll up, and now we're ready to replace our cache service implementation with Redis. So let's dive into here. First things first, let's go ahead and import Redis. So at the top of the file, let's call it import Redis from at adonis.js slash redis slash services slash main. This is going to give us a Redis service to be able to work with. All right, so let's go ahead and just roll through the different methods that we have here. So first we have a has method checking whether or not the key exists within our store. For this, for Redis, what we'll want to do is return. We can read from Redis dot and there's an exists method that we can utilize to check this. Now this method here is overloaded, meaning that there's a couple different argument sets that we could provide into it. The various options for this essentially mean that we can either spread in an array of Redis keys, or we could provide a Redis key array. There's an additional callback option for a couple of these here that we could provide in as well, but we don't really care about that at this point. We just wanna check whether or not the key exists. So within here, we could provide our key. Now, if we wanted to, we could mimic their spread behavior by spreading our key, turning this into keys, and now this string will be a string array. We can still provide a singular key because our arguments here are spread, but if we needed to, we could provide multiple arguments as an array. And now we can just provide our keys directly into here and we're good to go. So now we can get rid of our prior implementation reading directly from our store. And before we move on, let's check the exists method. So this is returning back a promise of number. So since it's returning back a promise, that means that this call is asynchronous. We currently have our methods asynchronous. So we do want to switch them to async. Before I forget, I'm just going to do that for all of them. So we'll paste it in here, paste it in there, and paste it in for our delete as well. So now we're ready to take care of our get method, where we're reading a value from the store. So for this one, we're actually going to want to hold the value here momentarily before we return it. So let's do const value equals await or read from Redis dot, and there's a get method, and provide in the key that we want to get. Now before we return our value, we need to understand how Redis is actually going to store our information. So Redis is going to store it as a string, meaning that if we pass it in an object or an array, we're going to need to stringify it before we actually put it into the Redis database. So since we'll need to set it as a string, whenever we get it, we'll be getting it back as a string, meaning we'll want to parse it before we return it back. So for our return, what we'll want to do is json.parse and provide the value in. Now, you'll notice a red squiggly here. That's because the value could be null and parse does not like that. It requires a value. So what we'll do is check whether or not the value exists by doing value and and. This is a shorthand kind of ternary check using the fact that JavaScript will return back the result of the if check. So essentially, if we have a value, it will move on to the and and check, parsing our value. And since this is the last thing that it's running, it will return that value back for our method. If our value does not exist, it will stop there and it will return back most likely undefined since our value does not exist. Okay, so now we have our get method. We're ready to move on to our set method where we're setting the value onto the store. So let's go ahead and get rid of this and we can return and we'll call redis.set. We'll set for our key and we'll set the value. Now we do need to stringify it. So we'll do json.stringify value. And there we go. Lastly, we have our delete. So we'll go ahead and get rid of our store deletion and we'll return redis. And they have a method called del that will serve as the deletion. So similar to our has check, this one also accepts a spread in array of arguments or a Redis key array. So we can do the exact same thing here. We can spread in our keys, change that to keys, and this will now be a string array. And then we can provide the keys into the delete call. So now we're no longer using our store at all. So we can go ahead and get rid of the private store key that we had. And there's actually one additional method that we can add into the service to make clearing out our database a little bit easier. Previously, all that we had to do was stop and start our server back up, and that would clear out the in-memory cache that we had going on. But since Redis is running on a completely different server, that complicates things a little bit. So let's dive back into the service, scroll down to the end where we have a delete, and let's add an additional method. This will be async, and we'll call this flush db. We don't need to take anything in for this one, and we'll just return back redis dot, and they have a method themselves called flush db. So we'll call that. And what this will do is it will flush out all of the data that we have stored within the particular database that we're using inside of Redis. We'll see exactly what that's doing here in a little bit whenever we actually clear our story. So we'll give this a save, and now we need to utilize this cache. So let's dive into our movie model. You'll see immediately our cache call is not happy since promise number will always return true. So what we wanna do is await that, and now we're getting back a number as our has check. If it doesn't find anything matching the slug, it will return back zero, which will be falsy, which will allow us to move on to actually reading our information. If it finds any results for our slug, it would return back one or higher, 
allowing us to dive into the if check where we can return our cache.get. Since this method itself is asynchronous, we're A-OK -okay to just leave that as is. Let's scroll up to make sure the rest of the file is happy, and it looks like it. So that's really the only change that we needed to make there. So one thing that I missed here is that set is actually asynchronous as well. So if we hover over this, we're going to see promise OK is the expected return for set. So we'll also want to await here as well. During my initial recording, I did miss this await, so you might see it disappear here in a second, but do note that you do actually want it to be there. Let's go ahead and give this a save, dive back into our browser, and we saw it do a refresh there. So if we check our terminal, we should see we didn't get any cache hits because nothing's logged into our terminal here. If we give the page a refresh, open our terminal back up, there's our cache hits. So our page is successfully utilizing our cache since everything worked a-okay. We can dive into our individual movies, go back home, and everything's still working. 